so let me share the slides. Uh, I'm Dr. Professor Vivek Gupta in Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. And uh, I think my time is seven minutes and with the respect and the permission of chairperson, I may exceed our detail. Uh, I will try to do my best to do this. So I'll try to share the slides now. Okay. Okay. So, am I... Are the slides are visible? Yes, sir. Uh, Make it first, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so the topic is uh, immediate stenting versus deferred stenting in ST elevation myocardial infarction. So, the ST elevation myocardial infarction is a very common, one of the most common cause of death in, in, uh, in our country. And we have to be very sure, I have to adjust this somewhere so that I, I have the full slide to see. The coming of the trends of CVD in India, estimated mortality from CSD in India is 1.6 million, which has in 2000 year and increased to 64 million by year 2005. Reports on CAD in Indians have shown that Asian Indians are three to four times higher risk than that of white Americans, is more than six times in America. Create registry was an important registry, which was there in 2008. Patients in India have shown acute coronary syndrome have a higher rate of STEMI than two patient developed countries. Our ACS have more STEMI as compared to this, and mostly the patients are poor, less likely to get evidence-based treatment, had a higher 30-day mortality. Uh, this is a very comparative slide. The CREATE is registry versus European Heart Surveys. If you say European registry, uh, we had the STEMI of 61% versus 30% to 40% in Europe. Onset of symptoms to admission hospital was 300 minutes, 6 hours. Uh, 5 hours. I mean, this is something uh, we have to really be concerned. And because the facilities are immediately not available. And overall, 30-day mortality was 9% in our STEMI group versus uh, this. Okay. So coming to the ACS presentation, chest pain, acute CSI, uh, acute coronary syndrome, persistent pain, STEMI, and STEMI, we all know this. I'm not going to dis uh, disturb the video. And we all know that if we have the patient is in cath goes to the cath lab in a PCI-capable hospital, the patient goes to the cath lab and the patient is not ne initially near non-PCI and the patient has got still two hours. We would like to shift to the PCI hospital. This is the guideline. If we feel that the patient will not be able to be shifted in two hours' time, then of course, it is better to thrombolize the patients. Uh, what is the immediate stenting versus deferred stenting? I mean, the topic, I mean, primary, the background, the primary percutaneous coronary intervention with stenting is the current standard treatment for patients with STEMI. However, there can still be no reflow or five in five to ten percent of patients after primary stenting, which can be associated with impaired prognosis. It is unknown whether disturbances in the microcirculation were actually entirely caused by distal embolization from the ruptured plaque or not. To date, attempts to avoid embolization by using thrombectomy devices and distal protection devices have not been proved completely efficacious. Although thrombectomy is a very useful device, and when I do angioplasty in primary PCI, we always use a large thrombus. We use the thrombosuction catheter, take out the thrombus, and then do the stenting to have a good flow uh, distally. The concept of deferred stent implantation after restoration of normal epicardial flow by a minimalist immediate mechanical intervention for stem was proposed for the first time by Isaz et al. What it is? Actually, what they say that what you have to do is that several subsequent observational studies have shown that the deferred stenting was associated with higher rates of procedural success, higher six months left ventricular injection fraction, and lower rates of adverse outcomes. Recent findings from randomized controlled trials are showing some inconsistent, inconsistent results. That's why this debate from the previous observational studies to provide a clearer understanding of important issue, we perform, there was a meta-analysis performed by them. Coming on to the highlight, what is actually deferred stenting? That means you put a minimal invasion, do a wire, in, in, let the flow come in, don't do stenting, do stenting after 24 to 48 hours. This is what actually is deferred stenting. And this was proposed by Isad et al. Few, uh, the innovation study, uh, I'm to talk, coming on to the few studies before I come to the large meta-analysis. The aim of study, this innovation study 2006, 2006, 16, sorry, 16, and published in general circulatory cardiovascular intervention 2016. The aim of study was to assess whether deferred stenting reduces the infarct size and metrovascular obstruction compared to immediate stenting. That means either you do stenting immediately or whether it is improved, useful or not, uh, deferred stenting. 114 patients, not many patients, deferred stenting was three to seven days later. Intra, uh, immediate stenting after prime protein in two centers. So this was there. So the result was that deferred stenting did not significantly reduce infarct size and microvascular obstruction compared with immediate stenting, though it was safer. 
Beneficial effect of deferred stenting in patients with AMI should be confirmed by large stop delta. Another trial, another trial which is very important, which I like, dynamic 3 deferred January. I have only two minutes to left. I'm sorry, but I think it's important. I will be given a little more time. But this was a trial with 1,200 patients. Minimal acute manipulation to restore a stable flow and immediate stent implantation in conventional studies. I go directly to the conclusion of dynamic 3, the first trial. The result of this trial indicated that the first stenting at the time of primary angioplasty is not superior for adverse cardiovascular outcome outcome compared to immediate stenting. In fact, routine deferred stenting was associated with a higher risk of TVR because the stenting at the time of second procedure at UTI was deemed unnecessary in many patients. Higher increase in incidence of target vascular revascularization. An improvement in LVF at 18 months was deferred stenting was observed in smaller subset that underwent imaging. This is hypothesis. A large meta-analysis was published in March 2007 in the Journal of American Heart Association. And the purpose was that to assess whether the deferred stenting is better than immediate stenting or not. And this was, I told you, that nine studies, including 146 patients RCT, were established. And there were the result which was showing was to find out no flow or slow flow, incidence of maize, major bleeding, or cause mortality, micro infarction, target vessel revascularization, long term ejection fraction. So, coming on to the no flow or risk, uh, slow flow, compared with the major stenting, a deferred stenting did not reduce the occurrence of no flow or risk flow. This was a very important conclusion from the RCT, which was meta analyzed by these authors. The MACE deferred stenting was associated with a significant reduction in MACE in observational studies only, but there was no significant reduction in RCT. So, MACE reduction was not significant in RCT, in deferred stenting, there was no advantage. Major bleeding, no advantage, all cause mortality. No significant difference was observed between deferred stenting and immediate stenting. Myocardial infarction, no significant difference in the deferred stenting was not, uh, not better. In fact, target vessel deferred stenting was associated with a significantly higher rate of TVR when compared with immediate stenting. So this was, uh, but long-term ejection fraction, LVF was significantly higher for patients who received the deferred stenting therapy. To discuss about this, the first, the first study of VCI did not prevent no or no slow flow in patient with STEMI compared with conventional treatment as compared to immediate stenting. Uh, ejection fraction, of course, was improved long term VF with the deferred stenting. Whether the benefit of this strategy could translate into improved survival in the long term needs to be answered by long term follow up. So, we are not sure whether the ejection fraction, which was better in this case, was actually giving major advantage to this or not. So, coming on to the advantage of deferred stenting, of course, you allow the better sizing because patient is a little more stable. It could provide a better appraisal of the revascular strategy. However, the disadvantage of deferred stenting strategy with higher cost, prolonged hospitalization, risk of reocclusion could also be considered. To conclude, in this comparative meta analysis, the deferred stenting strategy did not reduce occurrence of no flow or, re or slow reflow, death, MI, or repeat revascularization. This is very important. I repeat. In this comparative meta analysis of 1400 patients, a deferred stenting strategy did not reduce occurrence of no or rose pro, MI, death, or repeat revascularization, although they're in immediate as compared to immediate stenting. That means a result of large RCT are still awaited. Final conclusion of the topic ISD is still most vulnerable disease, leading to highest mortality. Immediate intervention is most in must approach to save life of ACS patient. Immediate PCI is, of course, we all know should be done as early as possible, whether but whether to do immediate stenting. Or not to do with major stenting, the meta-analysis have not shown any major benefit of deferred stenting. Some of the studies have shown high risk of other cardiac events and bleeding in case of major stenting in ACS. So there is a belief that deferred stenting may reduce risk of other cardiac events and bleeding. But so far the clinical trials have failed to show superiority of delayed stenting and STEMI than immediate one. Disadvantage of deferred stenting strategy with higher cost, prolonged hospital and risk of reocclusion should also be considered. This is the final conclusion. I repeat again. So far, the clinical trials have failed to show superiority of deferred stenting the STEMI. That means do the wire, do the thrombosuction, and do the stent immediately rather than waiting, just putting a wire and taking out the wire, leaving the patient. Okay, there's some flow is achieved. Don't do stenting. This is what deferred stenting. And do stenting after a few days or 24 hours to 48 hours. So there were some trials which have shown some superiority of deferred stenting, but the large randomized trials have failed to show any advantage. Therefore, it is preferable that one should always do immediate stenting after achieving the revascularization. Maybe if there's a large thrombus, you should do this. And the STEMI 2018 the STEMI guideline also shows the same thing that you have to do primary PCI. Thank you very much for this, uh, giving the opportunity, although it was a uh, very quick uh, uh, conclusion coming out of the meta-analysis of the uh, last randomized versus observational studies.
I had to really hike through slack in order to keep in time. So let us hear to the deferred standing, uh, I mean, uh, from Dr. Sanjay Chun, and then we can discuss. No, sir. Uh, Dr. Chakna, present in the case, sir. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Chubra has not come. Yes, ma'am. Okay, there is nobody to defend the first setting now. But I think... Uh, uh, yes, no. please, dear everyone. Yeah, I think uh, there are some subset of patients where, you know, sometimes, you know, all that you need to establish, to do is just to establish flow. So, uh, so... It's, like, you know, you do a plain balloon angioplasty and then acute coronaries and so on and so forth. So that, you know, at that, that point of time, I mean, you may not really need a, a standing with large vessels and then, you know, the standing may not give a... So they, I think the, uh, we all have seen the pros and cons of it, though the data is very clear that there's no advantage. But maybe there is a sub, some small subset where, you know, after wiring and ballooning, you get the flow across and then possibly even in smaller vessels as well. That means uh, the yeah. plain angioplasty or you would not like to put a balloon also. Sometimes it is the wire itself can lead to some, some flow. Uh, and would you like to leave at that all those subsets or would you like to... No, that's, what, that's exactly what I talked about. I think you were not there. So, where, you know, the inter the, the context of the stomach, uh, your lytics may also work or some other adjuvant therapy might really, really, really make your job much easier. But, uh, uh, I agree the data is not in supportive, but then... We have also seen issues where, you know, sometimes, you know, after a plane balloon, you get a, a slow flow. Uh, you find a lot of this thing, patients on IEPPs. So, some occasions, we have, we have brought them back to the cath lab 24 hours later. Things have brightened up and then you have, you have uh, got over the crisis. I think so, I, I, I personally also agree just a bit. I just want to tell that if you are not able to achieve a good thrombosuction, I think that time the flow is okay. And you still you see thrombus and TB1 flow. And if you anticipate there's still a thrombus there, which has not been able to set out, I think those patients, you can leave it a while and then put it on terofibam, eximab, and then wait for one or two days and then come back to the cath lab and then do it. That would be the one of those patients who may be advantage here because, uh, of course, if you have a thrombus and you put a stent, uh, then it will be, uh, TB1 flow will be converted to TB0 flow. Uh, certainly, that you have to say. Yeah, in fact, uh, that is what exactly I was trying to convey earlier also. There are okay. In fact, my, in my practice, use of thrombectomy has come down, come down drastically. I think it's seeing is believing. So I think sometimes, you know, the, these are the issues where, you know, light therapy works well. So you have a, uh, you have wired and you get some flow, the balloon is there, you find a uh, distal embolization. That's where you probably have to give an intracoronary or... No, I think the, there are spe sub special subsets where you really need thrombectomy. I would always say, somebody comes in early, Madam asked the question a little earlier, in a primary angioplasty, patient comes early within 12 hours. That's the time when I, I would generally avoid a thrombectomy device. But then somebody comes later after 12 hours or 24 hours late, and then you try to open up. Whatever try, these are patients who have this much bigger chunk, you will need the thrombectomy device more often. So that's perhaps the area where we will we'll use that. But as I right, yes, rightly pointed out, there, when you get a good flow and you find that the, the, the anatomy is not very really conducive for a stending, you convert a TIMI-1 or TIMI-2 flow into TIMI-0, then the, the whole job is defeated. I perfectly agree on that. I agree, Dr. Jayagopal. In fact, in your presentation, you have showed that there is a big chunk of thrombus in the left main and proximal LAD or circumflex right. somewhere. Right, right. So in that situation, I think one can not even wire the artery. And uh, you gave like TNK, you have tried, and then maybe some GP2 inhibitors. No, no, never, sir. I don't, I don't mix these two. That no, I no. That's one message which I want to convey because I think the even the data, the, the publication also which we have done, always primary be the, the golden rule is to have 5,000 heparin at the time of sheath insertion. Then if you are giving a lighting therapy and you still see a huge thrombus inside and you want to you want to administer lighting therapy, give the intracoronary and follow up with the full dose. But never combine this with the glycoprotein. All the studies, glycoprotein 2B, 3A, along with the lighting therapy, I found a lot of reading clearance and there is that is definitely against that. In fact, the latest ICE, it's called ice timi 49 trial. Just just come in a randomized study where they yeah, used, uh, uh, used this uh, uh, low-dose tenecto place. And there's a, there's a 40 patients compared with the placebo. So I think it's, it's important that we don't use this, mix it together. But uh, in fact, there are some case reports where people have tried later after 24 hours, huge thrombectomy, 
people have used a previous day, suppose you used a glycoprotein 2B, 3A, by the time the effect is passed off, then maybe you can use a lighting therapy, but combining both may not be the way to go about it. I said not combining. If you are finding a big chunk of thrombus, then one can give a, a, a GP2B inhibitor and then they next they bring down the cath patient to the cath lab and do the descending, complete the procedure. Uh, so that, that's, that's the message I wanted to convey. You give a, a, a agent like clinical place, if it's immediately, see an ST elevation myocardial infarction ideally needs either a light therapy or an angioplasty. The role of glycoprotein 2B3 is very limited there. It's an angioplasty agent. So I would, I would differ in the thoughts that you know, when you are not able to find the thrombus, you're not able to reperfit. Anyway, the indication is for a reperfusion therapy by light therapy. And it works well if it's given within a short while. So, whereas a glycoprotein, you have to wait for 24 hours. Whereas the effect of lightly therapy, you could see why it's in front of There is some audio disturbance coming in. So, that way, I think uh, uh, we, we would definitely see the results right in front of your eyes. And you salvage the myocardium. You don't wait for 24 hours there. Fantastic, okay. Dr. Gupta. Uh, you, have, uh, you have already done the aspiration of the thrombus before and to be understand. So, how much was the percentage of block? You have seen in all these patients. Was the uh, I, I think it has usually mostly. You said that you know patients who have uh, the thrombus formation usually need not be having a tight block as well. No, it's not necessary actually. In our I, my own personal experience, most of the patients will have a tight stenosis uh, even after removing this. And uh, there are few patients, young patients, I have seen that they have only like the plaquing of 10 percent, 20, 30 percent. Those are actually young, 25, 30. I've seen. I've done the youngest, 19 year old, and then the 29 year old, and those patients where there is absolutely clean and it was looking like a stent-like result. So I never put a stent in those cases. In fact, sometimes you don't require even balloon dilatation in those cases because touching with the balloon, of course, give you a small thought process that it may have a reception and you have to put a stent. But most of the patients will actually have a tight stenosis and uh, we have to uh, do stenting after good uh, uh, TB2 or TB3 flow achieve after thrombosuction and maybe we require a pre-dilatation and then put a stent. But I'm, I'm, I'm surprised Dr. Jeff Opal says that uh, he's not using too much of thrombosuctions. I mean, the, these the oh. catheters are... No. Uh, we are I, I personally feel that uh, uh, if you remove, I have recently done a patient who was actually very... Uh, I mean, there was hardly any flow. Uh, there was streaming one or just streaking of blood uh, or dye, sorry. And then uh, uh, I had to use a thrombosuction device and uh, it was perfectly uh, much better results with the... It was our right coronary artery. But why... You, what makes you think that these are not useful? Yeah, well, uh, uh, I was I was a fan of this thrombotomy device once upon a time, used a leptide and center. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, ever since I started using this adjunctive lighting therapy, it, it really does the job very well. And, and how long you wait? Point. Actually, I missed your talk, uh, talk actually. How long it, all you depends, it all basically depends on the coronary. I don't say that I don't use at all thrombectomy devices. It all depends on the anatomy. So suppose you have a huge thrombus and you know, you're fairly certain in a clinic vessel that's just a thrombus and rightly pointed out by you young patients. In fact, the COVID times one week, I had about six patients, my STEMI, all, all thrombus. So we're fairly certain it's just a thrombus there. So in that case and all that, so I generally try to see if there's an extensive thrombus and uh, as you said, if you, if you, if you're, if you think that, you know, you can get away with the light therapy, I would, I would, I would go ahead with that. But sometimes, you know, there are issues where you may have to use, a, but then my usage has come down drastically. And um, we do a fairly large number of families and in fact, there's a large series of patients now we have followed up on, on uh, uh, this therapy. So, uh, I, not that I'm particularly scared about using it, uh, it's just an added cost which doesn't give you the... Uh, yeah, it is an added cost of course, but it doesn't take too much time, it is just about another 5-7 minutes. So, it's, uh, once you avoid it, it doesn't matter. So, uh, that's uh, what I was trying to tell. In a, in a PAMI, I would even try to use an intracoronal lighting if, it's, if, it, if I so feel even before wiring. So, even... And that gives you the desired results. So I think we have already published my, I think it's in the... Uh, we will try to do that. We'll try to see. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, I think uh, the time is up. So it has been a nice session. Thank you all participants. And I also would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And it has been a well-conducted conference. And I thank uh, Dr. Mohanan and his team for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir.
So actually, this was a talk, and I think I will make another talk immediately now, and to make you understand what it is actually about it. Uh, you can uh, close the recording. Close the recording.